Welcome to the Melanin Jelly Project Conversations, a podcast that celebrates diversity and representation in children's storytelling, entertainment, and edutainment. I am the host, Olunos and Luisa Ivaze. On this podcast, I chat with authors and creators of children's books, entertainment, and edutainment. This is also a collaboration with the Ottawa Black Book Club. Welcome, Ruby Yaira. Welcome, Ruby Yaira Guka. The uh, loved all for uh, Mama's amazing cover cloth. My Thank name. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Oluno Saint Luisa Ivaze. I am the host of this podcast, uh, the Melanin Jelly Project Conversations. Um, mm-hmm. I started this podcast as a way when I because I write mainly for adults. So in the last two years, I started writing for children. And in the course, I didn't know it would be. I didn't know I would experience, encounter the challenges I encountered when I started writing for children. I just assumed that, you know what? Once you write an African story, all the publishers will be chasing you up and down because my adult books are traditionally published. So I decided, oh, you know, let me give the shot. So by the time I, I did the first draft and I got like 10 rejections, and, <laughs> and then I sent it off to a <laughs> <laughs> and I sent it off to a consultant and she said, first of all, Louisa, your word count. You can a children's book cannot be six thousand words unless it's a young adult book. And I went and then mind your language also because I'm used to writing for adults. So you have to come down when you're writing for kids. So I went, okay. So I started looking for information and sources. And I realized that most of the information I was finding were mm, not giving me the kind of answers I wanted. So I realized there's a gap in podcasts that actually celebrates representation and diversity in children's storytelling. So I just went ahead and said, you know what? I'm just going to start this podcast. And I'm also the founder of the Ottawa Black Book Club. So it's we're in our fourth year now. So it's a book club that is focused on books by authors of African and Black descent. We have a multi, I mean, since COVID, we've had a, we now have a multicultural membership. So people who just want to come in, have authentic conversation with authors, people who want to come in and learn. And then when I started writing for children, I was doing research on rappers. Yeah, which we call covlets. So I read it, but I called them, I think the book I titled it, um, rappers of love, <clears throat> rappers of love. So after okay. drawing it, I said, but nobody has written this kind of story before. People won't understand what it is. So I started doing my research, and that's when I came. That was how I came across this. <laughs> so yeah. So I'm just gonna go ahead, Ruby. Tell me about yourself and what inspired you to write this lovely book. Because look, hold on. I went all out today with my neck piece. And then look, from mom. Yes, from mom. I had to bring, yeah, because these are two of mine. So I had to bring, yes, I had to bring all of this because I'm like, this is amazing for someone to remember to write about this. So just to let you know that I'm also going to, now I'm, I've been giving, I now have the confidence to go ahead and polish my manuscript and publish it now. <laughs> so yeah, so go ahead, Ruby. Okay, first off, thank you so much for having me. Um, so my name is Ruby Iragota, like you said. Um, I'm a dentist and I'm a writer as well. And I got into writing quite accidentally, but then I've been a book lover all my life. Um, so Mama's Amazing Cover Cloth, uh, like you mentioned earlier, and this is my first uh, children's picture book. Oh. So this... Yes, this was born out of an idea. I think, I don't know, was it a conversation I was having with my mom or something? And then we were just talking about like uh, cover pieces and how you can use them. And I I just knew like a few of them. So some of the examples in the book. And yes, I remember it was something I had gone home from, um, from work. And, and then I was in a district hospital. So when the new mummies were coming to the hospital with their new babies, okay. they always come them up with a plot. So I was just mentioning that's how, and because it was a new district and had been in the city, you know, it wasn't something you see mostly in the city. It was when I had gone to a district hospital. 
So yes. So I mentioned that to my mom that so when you see the ladies coming, their hands are like this, but then um, they are all covered up. You can't even see the baby and all that. Then she said yes, and that's how I like to protect the baby from the sun. You know, the cities they maybe have an umbrella or they are coming an air conditioned car or something. But in, in the villages and the districts, that's what you do. Then we just started talking about like the uses of the cloth. And then I thought, well, um, wouldn't this be a, a nice project to undertake, you know, and to remind us all, you know, and it's something that everyone has at home, at, at least in Ghana, you know, <laughs> everyone has, has, or even as a child, you have your own cover cloth that your mom has given you. That's yeah. usually used as, as, as your, not really as a blanket, because it's too hot to use a blanket, but then that's why you Let's use when, you Call it a, like a covlet, you use it to, you, you yeah. cover yourself with it. You move around in the mornings, you move around the house with it and so on, yes, multi-purpose. I thought, I thought it would be an interesting project. And then around that time, I've seen some illustrations. And you know, uh, most of my other books, like this one, like um, these, you notice that the illustrations, oops, sorry, that's upside down. <laughs> the illustrations are a bit different. I, I'm not too sure what the name of this is. But then um, around that time also, I had come across Mr. Parry, who had done some watercolor illustrations for another writer. And I thought that would really suit um, this book. Mm -hmm. And I got in touch with him. And luckily, um, when I gave it to a publisher, the publisher was also interested. So, mm -hmm. but then I didn't want, uh, for the cover cloth, I didn't want this type of illustration. I wanted, I'd seen Mr. Paris work, he had done some work for some other people, and I'd seen his work, and I'd liked, and I liked this. Okay. So, uh, I reached out to him, and he said, yes, it was something he'd be interested in. And luckily, um, um, the publisher, Sub-Saharan Publishers, they had also worked with him on numerous occasions. So when um, I got in, when I gave them the manuscript and they liked it and they were interested in it, and I suggested using him, they were all for it. So um, Mr. Parry took over. We had a few consultations. He sent some drafts, and then um, we tweaked it a little before he colored it, and then that's how the book came to be. Oh, that's lovely. How important it is it, do you think, for us to tell African stories? Like stories about reg ordinary things around us. Because this cover cloth, for those of us who grew up back home, it's ordinary. We just see it for, we, we, we you know, you know how people say sometimes we take things for granted because we don't understand it. And I remember that part of what inspired me to write my own story then was, when my mom was coming to visit me in Canada, even at my age, I'm in my 40s, but my mom, anytime she comes, she always brings cover clothes. She would always bring one. And I feel that it is almost like giving you a piece of her when you are so far away and saying to, it's like saying, you know what, I know you are far away, but here is a piece of me. And I think that was what inspired me to put that together because I, even though I said it was Mama's Rappers of Love, but I just started thinking about it in different in different ways. You back your baby with it, you play with it. You know, when I came to got to that part where she was, you know, Superman. I, as a child, I did that. Sometimes you try to fly with it. You hang it, you tie it around your waist, hold it up, and you know, you run with it. So, how important is it? Do you think for us to tell? ordinary stories i like that you say ordinary stories because like i said earlier cover cloth is something every child would have or most children would have in ghana african children every in ghana yes every african child in ghana would have mm -hmm. and, and, and then again i've been to some international schools and then the kids have their mom saris and you know, something similar, a shawl or something similar. And and apart from the some typical things that we use as well, some of the games they play are, are quite similar. So okay. um maybe maybe I'll be just a little hesitant to say maybe it cuts across some cultures. Yes. Okay. But then um, another thing or another reason I really like the book is because 
once we send it to a class or you send it to when i go out for school readings the engagement is like 100 percent because everyone has it and you know uh, what i like that mr parry did was that he used some of our local designs you know so some kids will say oh my mom has a blue one oh i have that son. i have that one and then it becomes a competition of who has what in the class so like all the designs that are actually yes are actually you know designs that people would have in their houses yeah. and i think it's really important because it, it makes the uh, children relate to the stories you know someone says oh that's what my mom does or that's what i did or when my baby when my baby sister was born this is what we did you know or that's how i do it when i go in, at home or something so it just creates a, a talking point and another thing i've realized also is, is that it makes the children feel um like relevant you know like their experiences matter as well what they go through matter as well i had um, another book that um, someone else was telling me that her sister i think it was this one that her, her sister doesn't like to read but she read it because there was a black girl on the cover. The cover. That was the only reason, and she had short hair like her. That was the only reason she picked up the book and read it to the end, because there was a black girl, you know, the black girl on the cover, you know. So I think I think it's really important for children to see themselves in the pages of the books they write. And I say that everywhere I go, okay? It gives credence to your experiences. It makes you feel important that I'm, I'm good enough to to be captured in the in the pages of a book. So some time back, I set a project for myself that I was going to set a story in each of the. Then there were ten regions in Ghana. I was going to set a story in each of the ten regions of the country, so that at least the people from that area might not be your typical, um, you know. I might not get everything captured that you do in your in your town or your village, but then just that notion, just the idea that, you know, there's a story set in my region or in my neighborhood, you know, mm-hmm. just that it's empowering, you know, and I've had kids come and say, oh, but you know, you said we do it like this, but we too, we do ours like that. And I said, well, that's wonderful. Why don't you write a story about how you do it? Okay. Because in this town this is what they do so you write something for me about what you do in your town you know so it's just like a a, a starting point for for their creativity to roll you know and 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 when we when they see the illustrations others come and say oh who did it for you then i say yes if you want to be an illustrator it's a job opportunity you know there are so many things that just having a book with a character that looks like them would um, lead them to so i think it's really really important yeah because looking at you know picking up a book and seeing a child that looks like you you know these are mirror stories and you know we think of slight uh, um window stories where children mm-hmm. from other cultures too can look at it and have and get a peek into another child's life yeah yeah i think that that is i think that is amazing so you're a dentist by day and when i was reading up about you um i saw i made my notes here where you are described as one of ghana's most celebrated children's authors and this book alone has won uh, in 2019 let me see the uh it, it won the f sutherland children's book prize it also got uh, it was also named the cba honor book in 2020 it was on the ibb honor book list yeah how does that feel to be celebrated for telling african stories because you know those these are stories that you know how growing up like once again it's still this thing of yeah yeah these are stories that they tell all the time but how does it feel to be celebrated for act for for authenticity you're just telling your stories how does it feel well the the recognition is great you know because you know writing is something you do behind your computer in your room yeah. and for me my beta readers are mostly my family and a few friends you know and 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 it gets to a point that sometimes i feel that oh I think think it's good or it's nice because they know they don't want me to feel you know depressed that it was something that was not good but then to have someone who knows nothing about you who only knows of you through the work that you've done and to have a whole body sit down and adjust that as you know deserving of a price it just adds um 
validity to what you do it just serves as um you know your efforts are not being wasted you know and it just lends credence to the work that you do so it's nice to get the awards and other things but it's even nicer you know to go to a school and someone says oh i've read this or and you know something interesting happened like three weeks ago or something i was in the consulting room and then a little girl came in um, I don't have the book she had, but then she had a storybook tucked in her her pocket. Okay. And kids kids are mostly afraid to come to the dentist, so he wants to you know have like an icebreaker thing sort of, you know. So she sat in the chair. Then I said, "Where's that book you have in your pocket?" And then she took it out, and it was a book that I had written. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just it was just you know we we're both so amazed you know by the experience and. For me, that's one of the greatest things that, and and when you when you look at the book, you see that the book has traveled round. Yes, it was yes. it had, it was well read, you know, and it wasn't her book. She, she had borrowed it from someone who had borrowed it, you know. It had it had gone round, you know, and and, and I was really those are the things that that make me happy or that make me because at that age I was reading and it blights in sweet valley oh, and had generation were reading that and 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 in just like maybe 10 15 years to mm-hmm. to have kids having books that have characters like them sharing their same experiences you know so that that does like a moment where I felt, I felt really, really proud that um, my book was out there and kids were really enjoying it. Okay. Well, you said something. You said kids are usually scared to go to the dentist. It's not just kids. Adults too. <laughs> I am one of those adults. If, and when I went, the first thing I said to the dentist was, look, I have dentist anxiety. That's the first thing. Mm-hmm. So they said, okay, no problem. Even though they try to be gentle, but once I hear the sound of that drill, yeah. And one of my prayers is that one day some sort of <laughs> trauma will, will be produced where you pour it on, you drop it on a cavity, it melts it, so you don't need to drill. Yeah. So going back to lit- African literature, I remember growing up, I was a voracious, I was a voracious reader, and I used to write stories. And when I would write these stories, I would go to school, and my friends would be asking me, Louisa, do you have anything new for us to read today? So yeah, so I would give to them. Then, and then, you know, Mills and Boone was, it was the thing. I would be in yeah. class. I would be in class. I would have my math textbook. Then I would have my book, my Mills and Boone inside. Me, that was me as well. <laughs> yes, and I will never forget the day my teacher seized one of my books. But then I discovered pace setters. Yes, hey. yes. So, yes. I discovered pace setters. Eh? I read, I'm even thinking of starting like a sort of hashtag pace setter movement. For people just to hop on it and let's start talking about pace setters. I said to read pace setters, and I my, my part of my dream then was after high school, I would write for pace setters. But by the time yeah. I finished secondary school, they had gone out of print. I think they did only 161 or 180 books. And after that, they went, you know, they I remember what the thing was at that time. You, you remember when you opened it, they had a list of all their books. The list of books. Yes. <laughs> then you would take it. Yes, you would take it. And, and, yeah. and I still remember, you know, I remember that if you want, if you, look, you are looking for suspense, go and read books by Kalu Oku. Then yeah. I, yes, I remember when I read uh, Christmas in the City. Uh, was it Agua Rio? Christmas in the City, Agony in Her Voice, Ebu My Love, Stop Press Mother. From Bata and Rebecca, you know, those books. And then yeah. they went out of print. And then Heineman. Yeah. Heineman, I think, started an African series. I don't know, yes, I don't know how I don't know how that's going. So uh, I, I they had started, yes, yeah, so they started an African series a couple of years ago because I know that I had submitted my work. That okay. was, was like more than 10 years ago. I had submitted my work. Okay. But I don't know what became of that project. But they had started, they were actually focused, they were actually going to do like an African series and they had put out a call for manuscripts. Oh, okay. And I had sent in my work. I had heard back from someone. I have to check who that person is, what the person's name is. But I don't know how they went with that, how that went. So, okay. if you look at those of us from, I'm from Nigeria. You are from Ghana. 
our countries were colonized by the British, so our literature was practically British. We read all the Enid Blytons, Nancy Drews, we read the Barbara Catlands, and so on. And now we are trying to tell Africa, now in trying to tell African stories and promote African voices, what are some of the challenges you feel that writers encounter when trying to promote their voices? I mean, to tell stories, because one of my biggest challenges is getting was getting published before I found a publisher in Nigeria. That was one of the challenges I had. So what are some of the challenges you think African authors encounter when trying to... Well, getting, getting published is the... I think that's, <laughs> maybe that's the number one, number two, number three, up to number 10, that we can list other things. So getting published is still like the biggest hurdle, like getting a publisher that's, um, and there are some that really have a passion for for, for this uh, kind of work, but then um, it's how to market the books, getting the books into the hands of, you know, the readers. We maybe now the reading culture is a bit better than it was some years back but then it's, it's still a major challenge getting your books into the hand of the publishers and it's in, into the hands of your readers and um, understand where the publishers come from uh, because you don't want to invest so much and then um, you can't um, distribute the books or there's no market for the books so it's i, I think there must be a concerted effort, you know, to go back to reading, to make books interesting so that we have um, a whole generation that starts reading from the time they are babies, you know. So if we have books for babies, we have books for toddlers, we have books for kindergartners, and then they enter primary school, and then it continues like that. So you build that culture into them. So that when they are adults, because there are some kids that ex expect gifts, um, books only as gifts. You know, when I, I was young, I'll save and go and buy a book. The child now will probably save for something else and expect someone else to come and give their books to them. You understand? Give so, the books that they won't read. <laughs> but it really is true. So, but I believe that if we start early, okay, if if that culture is there, and maybe also not to force children into what we think they should be reading. If okay. someone likes graphic novels, let them read graphic novels. If if someone likes murders and mysteries, let them read it. Like, don't try to restrict what they read. You know, so that if there's, then there's that demand for all these other genres of books, then I think that we'll get somewhere. But I think by far the, 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 the hardest thing is getting getting a publisher. And, and, and I mean, the publishers will publish textbooks. I mean, the demand for that is always there. But then it becomes harder for them to sell books that you're reading just for, for pleasure, you know. So if the market is there, if the demand is there, if if um, some, some time back, maybe about eight, nine, ten years ago, I don't remember, but then um, we had every every student who was in high school had to read three uh, three books no matter if you're offering literature or you're science students or general arts whatever you did you had to read at least three books in a term and during that time um sales picked up because then publishers could sell directly to schools and because schools had this huge number but the cost of production was really low and then you could sell to them at a low cost as well Okay. But then now that's um, difficult. So that policy, I think, has been scrapped because um, you can't sell to schools anymore now. So now it's more difficult. Then instead of uh, pop, uh, printing large numbers so that they can sell at a lesser cost, then now you print smaller numbers and the cost of printing, you know, is, is quite high. Then you have to sell it at a higher price. So yeah. it's a long, polluted circle or cycle and i think all the stakeholders have to sit down and agree that one reading is important and what can we do to boost reading in in the public you know not just textbooks or inspirational books but let people just read for fun once we get that i think that'll be a good way to go and i think once the demand is there i think everything else will fall into place Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. You know, as writers, one, th one thing I, as a writer, one thing I remind myself of 
many times is that first and foremost before anything because even though as writers our books are like our children we're very passionate about what we write and the stories we have to tell i always remind myself that publishing is a business yes you might have a good story to tell but if a publisher feels they can't pop they can't sell your work then you won't get you won't most likely get published by them in nigeria one of the challenges i realized is that is one the cost the cost of printing cost of printing and then those publishers that have connections what they do is they try to get their books into schools because schools seem to be their biggest market and it shouldn't be that way it was, it was the same in in, yeah. in in ghana and so recently where now you're not even allowed to sell to schools anymore oh, okay, wow. it was the same yes uh, the same in ghana and um, so most of the books went through the school system and then you could sell you could you could have a print run that was fifty thousand copies you know um, you could even have two of that in a year or something and that was good for business that was good for the writer good for the illustrator good for the editor good for everyone in the cycle but now you can't even do that anymore so it's i don't know yeah in nigeria i realized that there are a few publishers who have it's almost become like a monopoly because they are connected to somebody in the ministry of education they are able to get the mm. print into schools and then it's a challenge for other authors because those of us in the west in north america i remember i had seen this work by this writer and she had she had posted that oh our books now are in school available in schools in nigeria if it's private schools fine you can have a conversation a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the proprietor and they buy the books and provide for the kids but if it's a public school and you know i had told a more seasoned author who had been writing for years and she said if her books are in the school system it means she knows someone way up in the ministry of education yeah. and i asked her why is that she said well she tried to get her book into the schools and after writing several letters nothing happened she wasn't able to do that how do you think we can promote positive reading culture in Af in africa in african communities because one apart from the cost of printing and purchasing a book people will tend to prioritize okay rather than spend because i when i bought this book on amazon i got it for less than 20 dollars so if you're going to print this in nigeria and you convert that that is almost five thousand naira with five thousand naira you can prepare a meal. Can <laughs> somebody be willing to sacrifice five thousand naira for a book they can't eat? They can feed their mind with it, but you know, how do you think we can promote positive reading culture in African communities? So, um, yes, that's that's like a, a huge challenge. Um, how do you make books affordable? affordable. How do you? Mm -hmm. Yes, because people can't even afford one square meal. You know, and books are sort of a luxury. So it's on the one hand, on the one hand, I would say that um, to 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 help us get into a habit or a culture of reading, then we would have to start reading with children from an early age. So something that I encourage, even when I go to schools so and we have kindergartners or you know, and they can't read. So I tell them that it's okay, you don't have to know how to read. You can just look at the pictures and tell me what you think the girl is doing with the cloth or what's happening, you know. And then they tell their own stories and whatever they say is fine, whatever they say is correct. Uh -huh. So if 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 we start that where um, kids, when they see a book, then they are immediately interested. That's one way to go. But then what I found happens most often is that books are often used as punishments. Like you go, you go somewhere and say, hey, stop watching TV or you've done or your child is playing instead of learning, look at what you're doing. Go, come on, go to your room and go and read a book. You know, so how is the, the child going to associate books with pleasure or with enjoyment? It's almost as a punishment or, or, or they bring their report card home and they didn't do too well. Look, after all this money I spent on school fees, you are not coming to your room and go and read. You know, stuff like that. So, of course, the child is not going to associate reading, you know, with anything pleasurable. He's going to see it as a punishment. Yeah. 
other thing I found as well is if 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 kids see adults read, then they are interested. I remember an incident. Um, uh, someone um, someone was reading, and 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 an adult was reading. He started laughing at something that was reading in the book, and immediately a child came over and said, "What is it? What is it? I want to know." You understand? Yeah. So if if the child sees that the dad was enjoying something, you know, and that's a book with no pictures, you know, but the child the child will see that daddy was enjoying that. So if the kid has something like that, he also enjoys. That's that's one way. But I think more often than not, books are I don't know, we delegate it like, you know, you you've been naughty, you've been bad, go to your room, go and read your book or something. So of course that's not going to work. But then if you look on the other side on, on how much I think for now it would just be say maybe the middle and the upper classes would be able to afford a book because like you're saying earlier, and um, that's five thousand naira is maybe even a meal for a whole family of five or something, because they'll have to manage, you know. But we have to start from somewhere, I think. We have to start from from somewhere, at least with the middle classes where they have some expendable income reading should be something you start from the time they are their kids not when they are um, nine ten years you know that you're now trying to get them into reading by then they are hooked onto other things maybe into games or onto other other things but if you start reading with them from the time they are they are young i think you'll be building that culture into them what do you think the government can do how can they subsidize because i keep thinking that it's for me my dream because i run apart from the book club and this podcast i run a charity so Mm -hmm. that that and that charity is focused on rural communities in nigeria where i do i give books i give sanitary towels and food you know to people in rural communities and i remember in december when we did our outreach our, our annual outreach i was going to do notebooks at least exercise books for kids storybooks and my sister has said to me that look Louisa yes it's a good cause it's good to give books but what is happening now the moment people are hungry if you give sanitary towels and books they will sell it to buy food it's oh that, yeah especially in rural communities so what I had ended up doing was I said okay you know what let's feed let's feed 200 people and I put it out on Facebook and said, oh, it's that time of the year because I'm from the Asan tribe. So the charity is called Simple Asan Girl. And you see our motto is, our mandate is a meal, a pad, a book, a meal and a pad. And that's it. And when I posted it, I was surprised. The feedback, oh, people were reaching out to me. Oh, how can we get involved? How can we get involved? And in the end, we, my sister, they were able to feed people in four villages. Wow. Little kids were running up to my sister. My sister said their hands were cold. Some had never tasted cake. Yes, because my sister baked, so she took cakes. You know, she just sliced and people, she said, kids brought their hands. Even babes, all dressed up with makeup, came for free food. Mm. So, uh, so my thinking there is, how can the government subsidize, uh, subsidize printing? Because piracy is a big problem. In secondary school, piracy was yeah. a big problem. Because remember those our textbooks those days? There yes. Be, you know, then there will be the pirated one where the text where the text will be going up this way or the text will be going that way. And some of the books, I know that the government has good intentions because some of those textbooks you will see under, not for sale. Yes. But you buy them. Yes. The government... Even, even yes. Some of- even some of the books that um, got the awards for the, but like a number of them had done not for sale. Yeah. But then some people have been working on the streets, and then you know those guys who sell books, yes. they'll be happy with the not for sale printed on yes. it. <laughs> How can we hold the government the government accountable for some of these things? You know something like this. Eh? It's it's I don't know. I don't even know where to start, okay? Because on the one hand, governments would be looking at, we still have communities in Ghana where children sit under under trees, you know? So they don't even have classroom buildings. Same with Nigeria too. Uh, they don't even have that. So on the one hand, 
how would governments who hasn't even finished providing desks and 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 classroom buildings or even if they are buildings there are no washrooms you know yeah. if they haven't finished all that books certainly are not going to be and and these are uh, are not even textbooks these are uh, uh, are just plain like literature books or reading for pleasure how is that going to be a priority you know so um understand i understand what the government is but then i again i i uh, remember when i said when it was mandatory when there was that policy that everyone has to read at least three books so that was a policy issue okay and 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 that was working so you would have um out out go places now and then you say oh i read your book when i was in high school and i said how did you get all oh, my school library had it or they distributed it to all of us you understand so while we can't we can't on the one hand we can't say that we are going to um, finish building all schools or finish equipping it with all uh, um, desks and furniture and all those things before we tackle books once there's that policy okay because then cost of cost of um, printing um, becomes cheaper publishers are guaranteed sale and then the the kids can 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 have the the books at a way cheaper price than you have if i were to self publish or now that the policy is not there it's 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 no expensive to buy a book so once they put those policies into place and understand that um it's 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 in european countries in america schools they have uh, books that are pushed down their school reading list and all those things so that's the way to push the books out there you know once your book gets onto that list because it's met all the criteria is age appropriate content appropriate all those things that's the way to boost it okay at least that academic year we know all the students in the country are going to have your book or or a book it doesn't even have to you know so that's one way to boost it and once we do that it's not even government who has to get the money they have four private people coming in because like you said publishing is a business and if people are getting returns from it then you have more people coming in there then there'll be the chance for other stories to get published and into the hands of 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 the readers and that's what we want so it's the policy So currently in Ghana we have a free high school policy and that really helps students who um previously were not able to get into high school because their parents couldn't afford fees. But then because it's free you're not supposed to pay for anything. Mm-hmm. Previously books were 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 included in their um in their fees. And at the time a book was less than um 10 cedis. was like 8 cedis which was less than a dollar because they were publishing in in large numbers okay uh huh so the quality is not there it's not difficult to sell and now if i had to go to the or if i had to self publish or my publisher was uh, pu- uh, printing more books it's only through bookstores and libraries and and still they are really 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 slow so it's not as lucrative as it once was so i think if government puts in the policies then enough business people would see that this is a viable you know business this is something i can get my returns from you know every three months there's a new book on the list you know so that's something they can put their money in and they'll see returns so i think it's it's the policies they don't have to buy the books or publish or print and distribute but once you put those policies in place everything will fall in okay so as a and as a as an author of how many books have you written i think i've i saw about 15 10 or 15 or 12 It should be a bit more than that, um, oh. because some are, some are just. Um, I, I think maybe maybe about twenty now, because I was commissioned to write some for some um, um, organizations. So some are solely um, digital books and other things. So I think maybe around twenty books now. I think. Okay, so how long does it take you to write a book? Like. It, okay, so. It, So two questions. How long does it take you to write a children's book and how long does it take you to write an adult book from start to finish? It it, it depends. Um um I find young adults books easier to write. I don't know why. So it's I usually just be thinking about the story 
you know, then everything gets into place. And I sit down and write. So anything from maybe um, a month, maximum two months, and then I'm done with a young adult book here. Yeah. But then um, adult books somehow take longer to write. I've had one that have that in like a year. <laughs> had one that on hold for years. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it depends. Every book is different. I might start on a book and it's not like I'm not liking where it's going. Then I'll just shelve it and move on to something else. Okay. So I don't really have a fixed uh, schedule for anything. If I'm working on something and I feel it's not working, I just put it down and then move on to something else and come back to that one later. Okay. So as as a seasoned author who has won so many awards, What are some of the tips you can give? Because people listening to this podcast and even myself, who, you know, I call, I call this my passion project. So I'm getting so interested. I don't know. Children's books for me now is, it's it's almost like I'm exploring. I've just discovered a whole new world. (laughs) Yeah. Adult books. Yeah. Yeah. I sit, I write that one. Adult books come easily to me. I can sit and just write. But with children's book, I'm st- books, I'm still working on the language. I have to keep reminding myself of the language. I have to keep reminding myself that anything that can be reflected in an illustration, Louisa, you don't need words for it. Yeah. The child can, yeah. But even at that, I'm still guilty of, I'll show you my books, two of my books. The, you see them, the, so there's the crowning glory there, there's the African safari. It. So this is crowning glory because I was just thinking, Louisa, you are not what do you write about? So now I think I can call my I have the audacity to call myself now a children's author. Okay. <laughs> For my adult books, I write about I started out writing, okay, so I started out writing teenage romance from the days of keepsakes and all of that. Then I moved into I got into this whole gender thing. I was writing about women's issues, female circumcision, early marriage, my collections and all of that. Then, you know, as you write, you start to find your niche. Yeah. Time. So now I think I have found my niche, which is interesting because I enjoy writing about the lower crust of the society. So Louis, if you, I mean, if you pick up my books, I will be the one writing books about that prostitute nobody talks about. I mean, everybody ignores. And my best-selling book, Authentic Mama, was actually about a mistress. And somebody was asking me, why would you be writing about people, a woman who sleeps with people's husbands? And I said. She's a beautifully flawed and imperfect human being. Yes, what she was doing was wrong, but she would go to church. She would donate wrappers to the women in church. She would give alms. She would do charity. So now for children's books, I decided, okay, I like history. And my very first job was as a teacher, as an English teacher. And I realized that there was a gap in African literature. So I said, okay, you know what, Louisa? Do write what you know about. So I said, okay, history. So I started with Crowning Glory, where I was talking about introducing, just talking about African hair tradition. And... Nice. Yes. Oh, yeah. African hair tradition. And I was looking at the Orishas. So this was Oshu, who was believed to have been the first hairdresser. So that's her from the sky. See her? That's water. That's the golden comb by the golden mirror. And back in the day, you know, in the times of slavery, hairstyles were maps because people were not allowed to write. Yeah. Hairstyles were maps of escape routes. And there was a time when in African societies, you could tell the family a person belonged to simply by looking at the person's hairstyles. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. I, see, I mean, that's so, I, I keep telling people that no matter what, I am still a teacher at heart in whatever I choose to do. A colleague's daughter, I was moved to tears the day a colleague's daughter read it. This, this is Bantu Notes now. Yes. So the day a colleague sent me a picture and she said, her daughter said, she's from Rwanda. She said, her daughter has been saying, uh, when can I talk to auntie? When can I talk to auntie? And I was wondering, why does your daughter want to talk to me? So she sent me a photo that she was inspired to do Bantu Notes after reading this book. Oh. Yes. So I have this, then the book two, because it's a series, right? So the book two, I decided to do the African safari. Mm. A lot of people don't know that tigers and kangaroos are not indigenous to the African continent. People just feel that, hey, you see everything. Back in the day when we used to watch Tarzan in Africa, they'll show you Tarzan with a tiger. We don't have... Tigers are not indigenous to Africa. <laughs> but you will see Tarzan with a tiger. 
So you see, text, text, text. This is after me editing this thing more than five times to bring, yeah, so you see, to bring the text down. So we're exploring different animals, the big five, the ugly five, the silent five, you know, all those things. So I did that and I went, okay, let's see how this gets the kids. Then I pushed it. I went, I had, I, I got dolls made. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, so these are just samples. So, as a seasoned author, what tips would you give for those of us who want to get traditionally pub- published? Let me start from sub-Saharan publishers. I think, I don't know if, are they still, are they still, in, are, do they still, are they still working? Are yes. Still existence? Yes. Okay, so let me start, let's start from your journey. You wrote this book. Tell us how you wrote this book, you sent it to sub-Saharan publishers. Did you know somebody there? Was it true connections? Give us tips on how to tell a good children's stories and your journey to publication. Give Okay, so let me break the question into two. First of all, give us tips on how to write a good children's story. What should we be looking for? And two, tell us of your journey to publication. How you wrote your manuscript and how you reached out to sub-Saharan publishers. Did you have connections there? Like we call it long leg. <laughs> Okay, so tips. My number one tip is um, know who you're writing for, okay. and then what they find interesting. Mm-hmm. So if if you're reading, if you're writing for young adults, what okay. books are adults now reading? Okay, and another thing I find that when people when people, especially when they're writing for children, then all they want to do is sort of preach to their children. Okay, like, uh, so, uh, and, and you know those books where uh, if you're a young girl, you don't listen to your parents and you get pregnant and you drop out of school, uh-huh. Like, everyone is tired of that type of story. Preachy yeah, preach stories, preachy <laughs> stories, uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, are tired, even adults are tired of that story, okay. So read what children are reading, read what young adults are reading, whatever genre you're interested in, Read what those people, read the current books that are top sellers. Go to schools, ask or your friends, your nieces, you know, ask them what 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 type of books do you find interesting and read those. And I tell them uh, that uh, right now I probably read more young adults books than I read uh, adults books, okay, because uh, writing young adults for me is easier, okay. okay. And, and the first time I read a book, I'm just reading as a reader to find out whether I like it or not, okay? Mm-hmm. So if I find a book I really, really like, then I put it down for some time. Then I go back, then I reread it. This time I'm reading it as a writer. Why did I like this book? Why did I like this character? What's made me keep? And you know, there are those books that, you know, you have a meeting at 7 tomorrow, but then after 12 midnight, you are still reading. Yes. What is this that's has kept me how did they make me just oh let me just you know let me just read one chapter by the time you know it's midnight and you are left with three chapters at the end of the book then you say my that's all just finished so what is it how do they end their how do they end their chapters you know makes me want to read you know so the second time i'm reading i'm reading with a critical eye because i want to know what the writer does how is their dialogue like what's their conversation like how do they start their stories what's draws me in or what did I dislike about it so that I don't repeat those mistakes um where is this set how are the young people talking so all those things but then I find people um get up and adults especially oh I want to write about a uh, uh, teenage pregnancy I want to write about this and I ask okay what was the last book on teenage pregnancy that you read and they haven't read anything like that Okay, they just have this this thing that, oh, there's this girl, she doesn't listen to her parents, she does this, she does that. And I said, well, if you don't know what people are reading, you'll finish and if you self-publish, you'll publish all those books and they'll be sitting in your garage, no one will buy. Okay, so find, yes, because it's, it's a fact, it's a skill, there's an art and a science to it. So find out how it works, okay? And, and, and there's a point that I was growing up that I didn't really like reading and... 
some African writers because like all the bad things in the world would happen to the main character. There was no happiness. The parents who die should be sent to a step aunt or uh, and you know something. Molested, should be molested, no justice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Will run away somewhere, they will steal her money. Like one person, how much you know, even can you take oh, man, tragedy? Yes, it's, it's too much, you know, and, and those were the types of books that were selling at a particular point. But nobody wants to read like that because it's life. Like you have at highs, you have lows. So let's see, let's see good things happen. Let's see bad things happen. Let's see the character do something good. Let's see her do something naughty, you know. And if you read other books in that genre, then you get to pick up these things and then you know what to look out for. You know what, how to end a paragraph. You know how to start a next chapter. You know, all those things. So I tell people that to be a good writer, you have to be a good reader, okay? Also, your story is just preaching, preaching, preaching. And the child will not read it. And adults even will not read it. We just read maybe first two, three pages, put it down, and then move on to something else. So read what they are reading, and and you are not going to give all your life advice that you accumulated over the year. You are not going to give all that in one story. You know, you have to learn how to take things away. You might have done research and found really incredible things, and you want to put everything inside, but everything isn't necessary. So as you read what other people have done, and that's when editors come in, and that's when you you would have to put your ego aside and say what's good for the book, you know, because you start up late at night, you've done 40,000, 50,000 words, you're so proud, and the editor wants to maybe cut some paragraph that you spent like uh, three days describing, you know, a setting or something, and the editor is saying this doesn't add to your story, you know. But you feel like that's one of your best writings, and she's saying take it out. So you have to, you have to know what builds the story. Every every sentence has to add on. If it's just there being adding to word counts, it's not really doing anything. So um, know what people are writing, and 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 you know those days where you used to describe your main character like the first few pages are just description you know we've gone past that so as you read what is current as you read what other people are praising or you know all those things you know you know what to do so for me that's my best advice read 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 and how i got into publishing so like i said earlier oh i've always loved um books and writing and i used to write um short stories and things when i was in in high school, when I was in medical school, I joined the editorial team and I used to write anonymously because I was scared of feedback. I was scared someone would say, the story you wrote in this magazine, it was blah, blah, blah. So I used to submit anonymously. I was not um, ready for that type of heartbreak. And then um, um, after school, during my house job training, and I had this health scare because of my medical background then. Of course, you think all the worst things is breast cancer, is spread, is done, blah, blah. It's, and I was just 20. I forgot how old I was, but I was in my 20s, you know. And I was, okay, so what if it turned out to be a benign thing, you know, and, and, and it's gone. But then um, my thoughts were just, what if this was cancerous? What if it had spread? What if? And I was just, what if, what if, what if? And, and, and then I decided to write a book about um, a young lady who is newly married who discovers a lump in her breast. And again, uh, maybe, <laughs> and I'm glad that book is out of print now because I'm sure everything <laughs> I found out <laughs> about breast cancer, I just packed it all in there. But then that was the starting point. Okay, so I sent it out to some publishers and then um, I went on an outreach to the northern part of my uh, the country, a rural place. And again, like the difference from Accra, the capital Accra, you know, like this opposite ends. And I was just like, um, and I was newly posted from school, you know, and I was, if they post me here, in my heart of hearts, I know I won't come. Okay, but how would a newly posted doctor here, what would make a doctor come here? What would make her stay? What would make her, you know? So that that said the, the beginning of another story. So that was my second story in the middle of nowhere. And those two were adult books. So I sent them I sent them to as many publishers as I could at, at, at the same time. And then um, when they were, I hadn't yet received feedback from publishers, from the publishers, but then, um, Whilst I was waiting, then there was this advert about the Beth Award 
in one of the newspapers and then I felt well I've written two adult books how hard can writing a young adult book be and then um, I decided to enter I kept postponing postponing I knew what type of story I wanted like I had everything figured out in my head and then when it was like um three or two weeks to the deadline um, one Saturday, I just got out my laptop and said, okay, I'm come to write a story. And I think the story in like maybe three, four pages, I was done, like from beginning to end. And this uh, a story that had to be, I think, 85 pages or 88 pages. And I was done in five pages. So I said, oh my goodness, <laughs> it's a lot harder than I thought it was. <laughs> so I took, I took some time off work. And then um, I went back and read and it Blighton and Hardy Boys and, you know, just to get a feel of how, because I was writing about a group of friends, just to get a feel of all that. And, 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 and that time, internet was not as reliable as it is now. Mm-hmm. So I had to go and print and then burn it on a CD and send it. So I actually missed the deadline by a few minutes, but they were gracious enough to accept it. And and then and the one third place actually this the oh. miss one third house yeah one third place in the first better one oh, yeah. of the one I don't have that one with me here yeah, yeah. so that eventually won and um, third place mm-hmm. and um, and you know there's a big you know once they had one third place and um, um, they found a publisher for me and just by all that ceremony and you know the pump and everything the publicity then i got to know all these other people in the publishing industry and you know then um code would um code, code would buy five thousand copies of they'll no, you're supposed to ten thousand copies yes and yeah, then they'll yeah. get a number from you and like it was yeah. just different, and, different countries yes. yeah yeah yes so I think for the publishers, it was like an easy way to market and distribute. So I got I got to know a few of them. So for me, after the Best Award, it's been relatively easy because it, it exposed me to a lot of people in the industry. But before that, when I was sending my, the first two books out, I had my fair share of, <laughs> of rejections. It's not suitable for us. We are not blah, 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 blah. Yeah. yeah. Because they so, want things they can sell, but like this sub-Saharan publishers, mm-hmm. I remember. I think I think I have re- I have sent them something years ago in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but these ones. So do they pre- uh, do they publish just academic books, or I'm gonna check my emails now, sub-Saharan. They do a mix, actually. They they do a mix, but again, because of the um, the policy now. Mm-hmm. Uh, really not doing non-academic too much non-academic stuff right now so how do you think that as as african storytellers because now i'm not using the word black now so for you on the african living on the african continent what are some of the challenges you think that african writers have when in trying to uh, encounter when trying to come together to work together and how do you think we can overcome this how do you think we can support each other how do you think we can promote each other's work how? I, think, I think the main thing is um writing really is not taking as as um, a craft or as a vocation is vocation the right way but writing is not taking as a job on its own mm-hmm. okay right it's more more like a side job or a side hustle yeah it's not the, and because of that, they aren't all the supporting people we need. Because, like, where would you get a good editor from? Mm-hmm. Where would you get a line editor? Where would you get a copy editor? Where would you get, like, someone who will look at the story and help you develop it? So all those things are missing, okay? I remember one of the publishers of one of my, my very first books, I asked about editing, and they said, oh, don't worry, we've got to cover it. And it turned out that they had sent it to an English teacher in a, in a secondary school, and that was the editing. So even so, that, that's what I'm saying. I'm I'm so happy that some of my first books are out of print because going back and reading it's actually strange, you know, like this is so obvious. Like now I can see it's like a glaring mistake, or you know, this whole paragraph was not adding to the story. Like we don't have that support that 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 we need. Where where are the proof readers? 
where the um, who does the layouts, who does the formatting, who does the cover design, and all those things. So all the supporting uh, team players that we need are missing. Okay, so you might have a good story, but who helps you develop your story? Who makes who makes sure that there's character development? Who who can look at you with a crystal eye and say this doesn't progress your story or your your character is not well drawn out? You know, so it's 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 something that's an aside and apart from like the very popular old names that we know of mm -hmm. and maybe the new ones now really how many people can actually say they survive from writing alone almost ah. everyone yes hey. and how hunger, they, hunger will kill that person <laughs> almost everyone has something else that's their main job and writers on the side so to be yeah. the point and it's the same with the illustrators it's the same with the graphic designers most of them are doing other other things on the side so until we get to the point where we can invest i mean how many um how many um masters in creative writing programs are there in our universities mm -hmm. or in our schools there are things like that you know so until we take the whole craft seriously and say yes this is a profession or this can be a profession how about poetry how about poets songwriting like it's just oh you have the talents then you go and look for people like all the effort is from you but where do i go if i if i'm a young writer or, or you know if i want to learn where do i go you understand how do i and most right now there's the internet so it makes things e easier but then it's also easy if there's a formal curriculum for those who want to go that way and the only way that would, would happen is if we take writing seriously as a class if we can call writing a profession you know and once that happens then people take us serious and even all these people that we have that we know of i'm and um, um Wole Shoyinka, all those people really, their writing was not honed in Africa. Okay. They are published. Exactly. So, what are we doing as ourselves? Why is it that we sort of have to be discovered by foreigners? And we, like, when you make it there, then you make it here. Why can't we make it here? Why, where are, where are our local hero, heroes, you understand? Where are local writers? Why is it that everything that is African writing right now is first defined by another country or another continent? Why is it they can tell us that this is African writing? Yet I'm in, in Ghana, no one is, you know, hyping my work or talking about me or saying this is what is African writing. So I think it's something we have to sit down and, and be intentional about. It wouldn't happen by chance. We'd have to strategize and be intentional and put things into place to make sure it works. And even when people talk about African writing, I realize that there's a certain kind of writing they want to see. They want to see writings about poverty. They want to see writing about yeah. Poor, yeah. 419 crime, all those things. Yeah. yeah, for me, when I write, I say, one thing I say is that people underestimate the power of humor. So when you yeah. read my adult books, even though I, I talk about painful issues, but in a humorous way, yeah. in a humorous way that you just sit and you laugh and laugh, it will, come, it will make you laugh, it will make you cry. I remember my very first novel was published in 2005. And I came across it. Thank God it's out of print now. <laughs> I just thought, yeah, it was probably in 2005 when I was wrapping up my first master's. And you know, I was reading the book, and in my mind, I said, Wait, Louisa, really? Really? It was published by Public Am Publish America. What? Do you know, as an adult, reading it now, I went, Eh? I wrote this. <laughs> People get out of print. I read it out of print. What nonsense. So you see how, as you write, you get more refined, you grow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So are you working on anything new? I remember that I came up, I saw, somebody had told me about your book, When Your Voice Shakes. Yes. Yeah, I read the summary and it seems like something, I'm not really, I'm not a young adult reader. I, I'm selective when it comes to young adult books. I read, I like books by Angie Thomas, the lady who wrote, um, Angie Thomas. Um, ah, what's the name of this book? I read Concrete Rose and one other one she wrote about a boy who was shot by the police. So she writes for young adults. But when I saw yours, I went, hmm, I think this is something I want to read. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so 
Yes. Uh, even when your voice shakes, mm-hmm. it's, it's a, a, a reprint of Plain Yellow. And Plain Yellow is one of the books that won uh, the Best Award. So it's just a different title and a few things we, we edited. But then back to what you were saying about um, how people perceive African books to be. You know, when I wrote Plain Yellow, it's about a girl from a poor neighborhood. She goes to stay with a rich aunt, blah, 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 you know. And then the next book after that was The Step Monster. And this was a girl, middle class to rich. Their family owns a hotel, a seaside resort, you know, all those things. So she she was a poor girl. She had money. She had, you know, someone came up to me and said, oh, I really think you should stick to writing about poor people. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. Why? Because the narrative then was African books, you know, poor. So I can't write, I can't write about uh, an affluent or a African, African, African family. Affluence. Yes. So I should stick to you, you know. And the reason she said that was because I said the restaurants, you know, um, the family restaurants were situated on stilts by the ocean. Mm-hmm. And I based that on the fact that in Ghana, in the eastern, um, in the western region of the country, there's actually a village that's entirely on stilts. We have in that the... in Nigeria. I think Makoko, yes. uh-huh. everybody there lives on water. Yes. So that was that was the that was the basis of that, you know. And and she came and said, oh, but that's highly unlikely. It's not something that should happen. That whole thing would be. And I was, how about in Sulezu? Because that's, and there's even a rural community and it's all on still. So what if someone wanted, are we just waiting for a foreign investor to come and do that before we know it's something which can be done? Mm-hmm. You know? have, it's almost like asking for permission to do exactly. to write something exactly. like that. Mm-hmm. And you know what indicated me later on was that right now we do have a, a resource, not in the place I set it, but somewhere else. Which is which is which is uh, a resort on stills. You understand? So it, it, it's it's why it's like what you said that people have this concept of what an African story should be. So in writing my stories, I try I try to write about everyday mm-hmm. people. You know yeah. how I, I how I was or my family was growing up. So that it's not always about the suffering. It's not always about the trauma because. For, for most of us middle class people, that really wasn't our story. You see, that wasn't our story. There were video games, there yeah. were nights out at the cinema, there were trips to the mall. So why can't young people in that situation read about that? Why must it always be the parents are dead? Dead, they are I would like you to read your book to us. Okay. Yes, please. I would like you to read your book to us. Okay, so um, this is one of my books, uh, Mama's Amazing Cover Cloth, illustrated by Mr. Edmond of Paris. Okay, so I'm reading. So I start from page three. Okay. Mama likes covers and slits. She has them in many different styles and colors. My favorite part of her outfit is her cover cloth. The cover cloth is a piece of cloth that remains after the seamstress has sewn the cover and slit. It has many, many uses. Mama sometimes wraps it around her waist or drapes it over her arm or shoulder or ties it around her head. When baby was born and Mama was bringing him home from the hospital, she used it to protect him from the hot burning sun. And when Papa got a swollen jaw, because of a very bad toothache, he used it to hide his face before going to the hospital. Mama sometimes uses it to strap a baby onto her back or to sew a dress for me or a jumper for baby. She calls it tight and places it on her head before she carries heavy things like a crate of tomatoes or a basin of water. She sometimes uses it as her bank. She keeps her money tied in a knot in one corner of the cloth. Sometimes she uses this as a handkerchief to wipe sweat off her face or to wipe my runny nose. In church, she uses this to dust the pew, to fan her face or to wave hallelujah. 
Sometimes she uses it as a mat and spreads it on the ground before laying baby down for his nap. At other times, she uses it as an insect swatter to keep away the flies during the day or to keep away the mosquitoes at night. During our festival, she spreads it on the ground for the chief to walk on while she and the other women sing and dance. And during the dry cold hamatan, she wraps it around me to keep me warm and to keep the dust out of my nose. When it drizzles, she uses it as an umbrella to keep the water out of her hair. In the mornings and evenings, Papa wraps it around his waist when he goes to take his bath. Other times, when Papa wants to dance Agbaja, he wraps it around his waist before joining the other dancers. Sometimes when it's too hot to wear clothes, I wrap it around my body and tie the ends around my neck. At other times when we're in a vehicle and the sun is too hot, Mama uses it as a curtain over the window. Sometimes I use it when I play with my friends. I tie one end around my waist and hold the other end high above my head. The wind fills my sail and makes me go very fast. When I play Superman, Mama's cover cloth is my cape. It billows behind me as I fly after the bad guys. When it's cultural performance day in school, I tie it into different styles for my cultural outfits as I take part in all the dances. Sometimes when my friends and I pluck ripe mangoes, I use it as a basket to carry the sweet, juicy mango fruits. When baby and I play, I use mama's cover cloth and pretend I'm a ghost and scare him, while I drape it over the table and pretend it's a beautiful horse that baby and I ride. But I love it best of all when mama uses her cover cloth to tuck me in just before she kisses me good night. <laughs> look, lovely. So what would you like to see for your books? Like, what would you like to see happen to your books? You are, I mean, you've won so many awards and you're already successful in, in regards to, you are a known name because you were described as one of um, Ghana's most celebrated children's authors. But what would you like to see for your books? What would you like to see happen to your books? I'm really, really, really thrilled. If, if my books got onto like the literature, it became a compulsory, compulsory YA literature book. Mm -hmm. like that would be super amazing oh, wow. if it got if it got selected to be part of the literature curriculum okay and if people want to buy your books where can they find your books to buy so in ghana you can get them vidya bookshop osu and then um online as book nook um bookstore mm -hmm. but on my website you can get links to those two places in ghana there are others who carry them but i don't know all of them off head and then you can get them on amazon as well if you're outside ghana outside but ghana. then yeah book nooks um, ships outside ghana so you can if if you can get on amazon you can get through book nooks. okay that's amazing ruby i just want to say a very big thank you because i know definitely i'm gonna i'm going to and we're gonna we are gonna chat again we really need to keep this conversation going because i feel that we are not talking enough about the challenges we are having we